Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Dr. Judith Lewis Herman, an MD, professor of clinical psychology at Harvard University Medical School and director of training at the Victims of Violence program in the Department of Psychiatry at the Cambridge Hospital, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her fields of research are the psychology of women, child abuse and domestic violence, and post-traumatic disorders. A pioneer in the study of post-traumatic stress syndrome and the sexual abuse of women and children, her numerous publications include Trauma and Recovery and Father and Daughter Incest. Welcome to Berkeley, Dr. Herman. Thank you. How did your parents shape your character? Um, my parents are first-generation Americans. They're themselves the children of Jewish immigrants from Central Europe. Um, bo they both um, uh, grew up in New York City and I think were my father f a child of working class parents and father worked in the garment industry. My mother was the daughter of a doctor, a, a um, family practitioner on the Lower East Side of New York. Um, I think both of them were raised in a secular socialist tradition, or I should say my mother was, my father found his way to it from his father's observant orthodoxy. Um, and um, when they both became academics. My father became a professor of classics. My mother became a psychologist. Uh, I think they instilled um, what I would call enlightenment values or progressive values in their children. And, and your mother especially uh, had a, a really strong influence on you. You, you write in one of, uh, uh, of her in one of your books, you write of her, her, of her psychological insight, her intellectual daring and integrity, her compassion for the afflicted and oppressed, her righteous indignation, and her political vision are my inheritance, you go on to say. Quite a powerful effect. Um, my mother, I think, was um, She was, she was raised, I think, by her father, who was this um, family doctor, very much, I think, in a tradition of service to others. Uh, if she'd been in my generation, I imagine she'd have gone to medical school. That was really not unheard of, or not totally, but un very unusual mm -hmm. for women of her generation. Um, she went to Barnard and then um, did graduate studies um, at Columbia in psychology and I think started off on a um, an academic track to become a research psychologist uh, and then was blacklisted because of a short period of membership in the Communist Party. And I think that, so the early years of my growing up when I was around 10 for example, um, we were introduced to the idea of political persecution and what people do under those circumstances in a very personal way. Um, my father had never been a member of the party, so when called to testify um, before McCarthy, he could, in honesty, say to the question, are you now or have you ever been, he could say no. Mm -hmm. My mother took the Fifth Amendment. It was clear that she was never going to get an academic job. Hmm. Um, and so she then went a different route and got clinical training. Um, but she, in her later work, she tried to bridge the divide between academic research and clinical experience. Uh, I think she also tried to bridge the, the divide between academia and activism uh, in a way that did become a model for me. Um, and I should also say that her, a lot of her righteous indignation and her sense of um, 
a kind of an expectation of um, integrity and standing up for your beliefs came out of actual experience. There were a lot of dinner table conversations about who was going to testify, who was going to inform, who was going to um, back up people who refused to inform and so forth. And, so, and, and she had a, a really keen sense, I think, of um, kind of irony and uh, indignation about all the weaseling, all the kind of um, fancy excuses that people made to, ma to, to compromise with something that was morally reprehensible. So that was, I think that was a pretty formative growing up experience for me. Any other experiences from your childhood, mentors, books read, that, that had a profound influence before the, the women's movement? We'll talk about that in a second, but anything else stand out in your mind? Um, I had a college mentor that I, I really should recognize, I think, and, and honor. This was a professor of um, French civilization at Harvard named Lawrence Wiley. Um, an anthropologist, really. Uh, and he had done a village study in France in which he applied the methods of anthropology ordinarily applied in uh, so-called um, primitive societies mm -hmm. to a French village. Mm -hmm. Um, he was a participant observer. He had gone there with his family. He had written about it um, in a deceptively simple mm -hmm. manner that um, I think um, uh, actually was extremely sophisticated but didn't involve um, any high sort of... Um, Theoretical concepts. High, yeah, well, idea. they were embedded in the mm -hmm. observations right, right. and in the presentation. So lucidity. There was a lucidity. There was a lucidity and a, cl and a warmth of storytelling in this book. And it, it, uh, was a, it became a very popular book, and he ended up becoming um, the Douglas Dillon Professor of French Civilization mm -hmm. at Harvard, which um, was a funny fit for him. Because he was, he was a very modest and unpretentious person. And I, I don't know if he ever kind of lived up to the grandeur of this endowed chair. But um, he was a wonderful teacher. So b uh, both of these influences strike me as pushing you, uh, leading you, guiding you in the direction of, of thinking outside the box, which is one could say that, that uh, characterizes your work. Yes, and also... Um, of keeping your th your concepts very close to obs direct observation mm -hmm. and direct experience, and in the case of Larry Wiley, we he had a seminar on village culture that we read all the classics, but then the idea was to immerse ourselves in primary data and eventually to go to the village and. Um, and to keep, uh, the, the assignment was basically to keep a journal and to record your observations directly and see what you could then infer from your observations. The other thing he taught me was cooperative learning, which it, it, there wasn't a name for it then, but he got these very high-powered students to be in his seminar and they would all kind of raise their hands and uh, kind of spout forth with their ideas and he would say things like that's such an interesting idea and it sounds so much like what <laughs> so-and-so said why don't the two of you work together mm -hmm. and see if you can develop this idea together and we'd sort of look at each other in horror because mm -hmm. that was sort of cheating mm -hmm. um, uh, but he uh, through his actions and through his example he modeled a different kind of learning in a different kind of intellectual enterprise, I think, for me. And it's something that you've carried out in your work, namely the, the whole notion of listening uh, and, and reporting what you're observing, but also learning in the process from others. And, and in this regard, uh, the, the women's movement of the 60s seems to have had 
an impact on you. Now, I, I, I'm curious now, after learning of these other influences, how it, the, the, the ingredient that it added uh, to your, the education of Judith Herman. <laughs> well, uh, uh, for me, this was a logical extension of the activism that I was already involved with. I had been involved in the civil rights movement. I had been involved in anti-war, uh, the anti-war movement, um, prior to the kind of explosion of second wave feminism and um, the late 60s. And um, Kathy Sarachild of New York Red Stockings, who was a classmate of mine at Harvard Radcliffe, and who had been in Mississippi also with me in, in 1964. Um, she's the originator of the term consciousness raising and um, the, uh, and, uh, and her, like many of the early feminists who came out of the civil rights movement, her organizing technique came out of the work she had done in civil rights and involved people speaking directly of their experience as a way to study our condition. Um, she called um, consciousness raising basically an empirical method of investigation. Mm -hmm. And um, her view was that for people whose experience was not articulated, not recognized, not visible in the <laughs> theory class, so to speak, the only way to begin to make our, our experience known to ourselves was to start with the concrete, with the testimony about the concrete conditions of our lives. So it was a connect for, for me and many women of my generation, I think, to start to apply those methods not only to the social issues of racism and war, but to the conditions of our own rather privileged lives and to recognize that oppression takes many forms. So, so then in a way it was a, a spark for your creativity and it, it helped you sort of look at yourself and your condition and, and the broader context in which uh, 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 that condition was created, here namely the, the oppression of women. Right, and also, I mean, the lesson for me was that one becomes most effective when one, one is speaking out of one's personal experience and um, one's action grows out of the understanding of one's immediate personal experience. Now, uh, you went to Harvard, you, you went to Radcliffe, then mm -hmm. to Harvard Medical School. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're a medical doctor. Uh, what were you doing in Mississippi? Just part of the civil rights movement? That, uh, you know, part of I, the, I, the was, I was recruited um, by a, um, a friend and colleague and now, a, now more recently a partner um, named Alan Grobard who had gone to Mississippi the summer before mm -hmm. Freedom Summer with Marion Wright, now Marion Wright Edelman. Mm -hmm. And they had developed this idea that um, it would be good to have a kind of an academic exchange between Harvard and Tougaloo College, which was at that time, um, it, it's based in, um, outside of Jackson, Mississippi, and was a black college. And uh, so they implemented this program that involved an exchange of students and faculty um, during that summer. And then when SNCC and um, the other organizations developed Freedom Summer, we became an affiliated part of that project. Um, uh, uh, you got interested uh, early on in, in, in trauma, but specifically in the problem of incest. In, in one of your books, you describe uh, a paper, your first paper with Lisa Hirschman, and, and it, it, it really uh, was a case where it almost was an underground paper. Tell us a little about that. That is, the, the, the ideas that you were proposing, both that there should be focus on this subject and to actually look at its broader context was quite revolutionary, quite radical. It, it went to the roots of, of the problems. 
Well, that's, um, that's what we thought at the time. And the reason we thought that was that we were seeing cases that in our, Lisa had just finished her training as a psychologist. I had just finished my psychiatric residency. Um, we were doing some peer supervision, really. Um, and we'd seen all these incest cases, and we kept <laughs> wondering, what is th what's going on here? Why are we seeing all these cases? Is there something about us that's attracting? That if, um, or is this something that everybody starting out as a therapist sees? And if so, why isn't anybody else saying anything about it? And we kept saying, waiting for someone else to say something about it. Um, and we waited and waited and nobody did. So then we finally said, well, maybe we ought to. Um, I think what in gave us the courage to do that, besides our relationship with each other, was having come out of consciousness raising, being po feeling that we were part of a movement where um, it was OK to trust your own observations, even if Nobody else seemed to think that what you saw made any sense. Uh, it, it, before we talk a little about trauma, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which became a major focus uh, 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 of your work, uh, I want to have you talk to us about something you say at the beginning of your book on trauma and recovery, and that is you relate uh, the history of psychological insight to the ferment of the times, and in a in a in a short history, you show how Freud's work on Freud and others' work on hysteria, uh, hysteria came at a political moment, you know, in French history. That the work on uh, war veterans and trauma in war veterans came as part of an anti-war struggle, and then finally that insights on women and the traumas that they suffered came uh, in, in the political climate, or the aftermath of the political climate of the 60s. Tell us a little about that, because that's very important in your thinking uh, uh, about these issues, especially the issue of trauma. Well, you know, psychology is a very soft science, <laughs> so putting it at its most charitable. Um, what one observes about human mm, behavior, human consciousness, human relationships, um, is so embedded in the, uh, what, what we observe and how we conceptualize what we observe is so embedded in um, the context of what we're looking for. Um, and how we name it, it's, you know, this, um, this isn't physics. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that even the, uh, the paying attention, mm -hmm. the selection of what it is that we're going to consider interesting and significant, um, in human behavior is so formed by the social and political context that we're embedded in. And um, and I think that's particularly true about um, the emotions related to um, power and control, the emotions related to one's place in society, one's place in the family, um, the emotions of, of shame, of resentment, of pride, of uh, a sense of uh, legitimacy or illegitimacy. So, um, Even to, even to pay attention to what 
women say about sex, motherhood, um, uh, relationships, uh, depends so much on what one thinks a woman ought to be saying, ought to be feeling, uh, is legitimate to express. Um, unless you have a political movement that says, uh, forget what everybody else thinks you ought to be feeling, what you, what you ought to be saying, get down to it, tell the truth, what did you actually think and feel and notice in your body. Um, you need a safe space to be able to do that. You need a political context to be able to do that. And, and in the end, art, uh, what are the intriguing uh, uh, points that emerge from your book is that in focusing on the trauma endured by children and mothers, which is a new agenda, as mm -hmm. you just discussed, that what you, what you find is an insight that actually extends just beyond them to, to victims of political torture, to war veterans, and so on. So that in a way, in, in looking at the particular, you end up with the universal. <sighs> To me, that's kind of, it seems so clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know but. why it's so hard to figure out. You know, oppression is oppression. Being the underdog is being the underdog. Right. Being treated with contempt is being treated with contempt. Being treated violently is being treated violently. It kind of, people kind of respond the same way to it when you know, when you get right down to it, mm -hmm. pain is pain. Mm -hmm. But it, 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 I, I do think showing that obvious point mm -hmm. is radical and was radical at the time you did it because of the boxes that are created to not make those connections, yeah. actually. Well, uh, I mean, radical ideas are always very simple, it seems to me, mm -hmm. um, for that precisely that reason. So, and, and they're only they're only radical because of those obstacles. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? Not because of their oh, I, right. complexity. Yeah. Now, t t so so you so you focused on trauma, especially mm -hmm. in women, women and and children. And and what I'm uh, help us understand what post traumatic stress syndrome is. Okay. Um, well, I can tell you about what it says in the DSM-4. Which is the official Bible of the Psychiatric Association. Right, right. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, fourth edition. Um, and I was on the committee that helped write this definition, so I have to take some responsibility. Um, The, uh, what, and, and the committee, I have to say, brought together people from, who'd worked with traumatized people on many different um, uh, social settings, combat veterans, accident victims, less from the sphere of sexual and domestic violence, but we were represented to some degree, political violence. Um, and what the consensus came out to be was that traumatic events were those that uh, instilled a feeling of terror and helplessness. Um, we used to say, by the way, that these had to be advanced outside the realm of ordinary human experience. And we, we had to get rid of that, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because if you're living in a war zone, um, or you're living in a country emerging from dictator, or that's experienced dictatorship. These are not out of the ordinary experiences, unfortunately. But experiences that instill helplessness and terror. Um, and terror turns out to be different from fear. Mm -hmm. Fear is something that we're all biologically wired to experience when we're in danger. Um, and we share this with mm, many other animals. 
when we perceive danger, we alert, we startle, we look around and figure out, do a quick appraisal of the situation, then we either fight or flee. Um, that's being revised now by some researchers looking more at women who say, you know, fight or flight is a little bit more the male response, tend and befriend tends to be, you know, that there's a tendency to kind of huddle with one's kind that um, you observe more in females, but okay, fight mm -hmm. or flight. And there's a whole biology of fear that's involved. Um, fight or flight doesn't work in con conditions of terror and helplessness. And under those conditions, it appears <coughs> that um, some kind of biological re rewiring seems to happen in people and in animals as well. So that in the after, even after the danger is over, the person continues to respond to reminders, to uh, both specific reminders and to generally threatening situations as though this terrifying event were still occurring in the present. So you have the activation of the fear system, hyperarousal. You have a kind of re-experiencing of the trauma that takes the form of flash flashbacks, nightmares, and so forth. Um, and then you have this other, more poorly understood part of the traumatic syndrome that has to do with a kind of shutting down of responsiveness, uh, numbing, a sense of that things aren't real. Uh, there may be um, amnesia for some or all of the event. Um, a sense in the aftermath that one is just kind of not really oneself. One is going through the motions. There's a loss of connection of things that are were previously of interest. And these are called the numbing or withdrawal or, or um, symptoms of PTSD. So hyperarousal, re-experiencing, numbing is the sort of triad. It's a descriptive formulation. We understand a little bit about the psychobiology, not a whole lot. Um, and I think we're coming to understand more and more that that's the simple form. That's what happens to some people after a single impact trauma, if you repeat it over and over, and, uh, especially if it begins early on and one's development is formed in this environment, it gets a lot more complicated. And this is often the case of, of women and children who are in domestic situations where the cycle goes on and on until... I think it's true of people in any situation of coercive control, whether you're talking about a hostage situation that goes on for a long time, whether you're talking about sexual uh, domestic violence or sexual child abuse, whether you're talking, some religious cults have this mm -hmm. same um, captivity kind of situation. Um, and then, of course, the political situations of concentration camps or uh, political prisoners. You, you uh, in, in, in uh, summarizing or, or introducing your discussion, uh, you, you say the dialectic of trauma gives rise to complicated, sometimes uncanny alterations of consciousness. And then you go on to compare the political double think in an Orwell novel with the what the psych psychologists and the psychiatrists call disassociation. So in a way you're, you're suggesting that uh, th this kind of uh, repression, mm -hmm. uh, uh, inability to confront both the individual reality and the, and the larger reality is something that happens to the individual and in some ways to the society. Yeah, it's um it's fascinating. I mean, if you talk to survivors of especially the prolonged and repeated trauma where the perpetrator, the captor, the torturer um, isn't content to just have external compliance but wants the captive to, uh, to um, 
adopt and endorse his worldview. Um, even after liberation, what you'll get people saying is, I'm living in a double reality. I have the present and the past coexisting in my mind. It's not clear which is more real to me. Mm -hmm. And I have what's left of my old value system or my old way of seeing the world and the perpetrator's way of seeing the world coexisting in my mind. And I, I can go back and forth between the two and I'm not sure which mm -hmm. I belong to or which belongs to me any longer. Um, so people have the experience of living in a double reality. Um, and they describe, um, even with the, the, even the amnesia, mm -hmm. um, people will describe simultaneously knowing and not knowing what happened, remembering and not remembering what happened. Um, when people get their memories back, they will often describe it as, um, uh, simultaneously reliving the experience and being outside of it as though it happened to somebody else. So, um, uh, people really learn to divide their consciousness under conditions of captivity, under conditions of coercive control. And since we don't even understand unitary consciousness very well, mm -hmm. when people have got double consciousness, double reality, um, we're, I mean, I, to me, it's, I'm in awe. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a fascinating window, in a way, into how the mind works. And, and th this experience that you're describing in, in, uh, in your book, you actually quote extensively from the memoirs of everyone from a, a former uh, star of, or not a forced uh, participant in pornographic films, but also a political prisoner. Uh, and, and there are sort of common themes that run through their sense of this experience, which you, which you have just summarized. Well, and you wouldn't, it, it, to me, that's not surprising, given that the methods of the torture and the methods of the pimp or the pornographer are often similar. And I, I think when we understand more about mm, criminal gangs as an intermediary form of organization between, say, state-sponsored terrorism and um, one-family cells of domestic violence, mm -hmm we'll understand more about the transmission of methods of, of torture, methods of coercive control. Um, but if you use the same methods on people, whether you're doing it in the name of the state, mm -hmm. in the name of a criminal gang um, that's marketing your body, or whether you're doing it in the name of the authority of the father or the name of some religious cult, the methods are the same and so the mental processes that they produce are likely to be the same. In your work, you, you, you enter this realm of, of such uh, apparent hopelessness and despair, but, but the other side of your work is identifying the features of essentially hope and recovery and, and, and the road back. And, and I'm, I, I want you to discuss with us sort of the elements of uh, uh, survival. Mm -hmm. That is survival and recovery, which is, is the other part of the title uh, of your book. So, so what, what, what are the elements that, that we see, the common elements, in, in people who experience this but make it back, so to speak? Um, first of all, I guess I should say that I'm, uh, that's the other reason I stick with this work, is I'm constantly in awe of the resilience of the people we work with. They really do get better. They really do make new lives for themselves. They um, find incredibly creative ways to put the pieces of their lives back together. And a lot of times, the, since a lot of the work I do now is supervising students, teaching them how to be therapists, um, uh, 
I, I get to observe the way the patients reinstill hope constantly, not only in, in, uh, in the students and then in those who are kind of privileged to watch and observe this process. Um, the students will come in and say, I just met with this woman from Rwanda and she, you know, she lost her whole family. She managed finally to get out to Uganda with two of her brother's kids and there, and, you know, staying with a minister in Uganda and she came here, she, they only could get papers to bring her. She's working under the table, cleaning houses or cleaning offices at night. She has no money, she's living in an apartment with 10 people um, and she has the worst PTSD I ever saw and she's here for a political asylum evaluation. Mm -hmm. What do I possibly have to offer this person? Mm -hmm. Um, and in the first interview, here's a woman who speaks in monosyllables. Um, her, her eyes are down, her head is bowed, her shoulders are like this, she's hunched over. Um, she's, uh, if you drop something on the floor or a car backfires outside, she jumps out of her seat, otherwise she's immobile like this. And you think, this is the worst depression, this is the worst PTSD I've ever seen. PTSD means post-traumatic post -traumatic stress. Post-traumatic stress. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. And so you work on documenting her case for her political asylum hearing. Um, and you also work with her on trying to understand, is she, is she safe now? What's her environment like now? What can she do to... Um, what does she need now to begin to rebuild her life? And within a, a few months, this same person comes back into our office. And she's lively, she's smiling, mm. she's talking. She's gotten her asylum, so mm. she's safe now. She's starting to work on bringing those kids over. She's um, joined a church or she's started an uh, English class, a lot of the work we do is through interpreters. Um, she's found on her own some kind of community with our encouragement and she will come back and say, you know, uh, you listened to me, you seemed to care, you helped me out, you gave me what I needed to get what I needed. Um, that restored my mm. faith in people. Um, and we sort of feel like all we did was, you know, we did so little. Um, but it was enough. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a way in which survivors, many survivors make do with the least little bit mm -hmm. of um, human caring, human concern to put, to put back the pieces of their lives. And so from my point of view, if we can provide that, um, it's a gift that comes back to us many times over. Uh, and, and, and so, as, as you've just said, there, there are really three elements. It's, it's sort of providing them a zone of safety, mm -hmm. then they remember and tell their story, and then, but very importantly, they have to, to reconnect. I'm curious as to how you would characterize uh, what you do beyond what you just said. Obviously, you do some interviewing, mm -hmm. and, and is, it, is it an important element of that interviewing to, to be a witness? And to provide the, the essential elements of these these this this uh, safety, this uh, support for telling the story. I think bearing witness is important. I think um, you know I don't. I also don't want to minimize the skill or the sophistication of the treatment that we do because people, a lot of people come to us do have complicated both medical and psychiatric conditions and they 
they don't just necessarily have post-traumatic stress disorder. They mm -hmm. need all of their, mm -hmm. um, their needs attended to, and they're often quite complex. I'm thinking of a, of a woman, for example, who, um, who it turned out, um, I mean, here's, a, here's an example of how complicated it became. Um, it turned out that this is someone who had been repeatedly raped in it's another political asylum case um, and was having persistent vaginal bleeding, um, which, uh, and had never had a medical exam. But because of the vaginal bleeding also, was considered unclean, couldn't have intercourse, also couldn't enter um, a mosque. This mm. was um, an Arab woman, an Is uh, from Al yeah. Muslim woman from uh, Algeria. Uh, and um, so that getting her proper G GYN attention, mm -hmm. On the one hand, the medical part of it needed to be attend attended to. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we needed, we needed to find sort of a friendly mosque. Mm -hmm. um, we needed to find someone in the clergy who could actually begin to reconnect her with the spiritual community. And we needed to do some family work mm -hmm. in order to... Um, uh, start helping her uh, repair her relationship with her husband. Um, so, um, and this is someone who really w felt deep, the, the meaning of the trauma um, in terms of a sense of stigma, contamination, uh, ostracism, and so on, mm -hmm. It was not metaphorical. Mm -hmm. It was carried on in the physical symptom of bleeding, and until the bleeding was addressed, there really wasn't any hope of um, making new meaning out of what happened to her. So we pay a lot of attention to the meaning of specific symptoms in individual cases, and we really take an approach that ranges from the biological to the social. In your work, this, this emphasis uh, on community mm -hmm. and issues, broader issues such as power, mm -hmm. recur again and again. And in the specific case of uh, uh, your uh, careful examination of, of the problem mm -hmm. of incest, uh, where you end up, if, if I can summarize, and I hope I'm not being unfair, is in a way to look at the broader society and to ask the question, well, will this kind of problem ever go away in a patriarchal society? And, and in a way, your answer is no, mm -hmm. on the one hand, and, but, but that leads you to propose essentially uh, the need for political action in the sense that, that we then, that, that what you have to then look at is the family in which the partners are equal. The male is not the dominant one and it's only in such an environment uh, that one can find a, a kind of equality where men, for example, are involved in the rearing of children, more than are involved, are, are equal partners. And that's how you really get at the root of the problem. So, so in a way, this analysis is, goes back to what you learned at the dinner table, Rod. That's right. That, that, that psychological insight cannot be separated from political insight and action. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, would you add anything to that? Uh, that? I hope it was an unfair summary of where, but, but, but in the end, it, 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 the individual can't deal with this alone is what I'm trying to get at. No, and I think that's the take home message that I try to give um, whenever I teach, whether, and whenever I do my therapeutic work, whether, I don't think patients, uh, survivors, victimized people can re recover in isolation. Mm -hmm. They need other people and they need, um, to take action in affiliation with others. Um, I don't think therapists can do therapeutic work alone. Mm -hmm. 
we get, when we're isolated with this, we do give in to despair, we do burn out, or we, we lose our perspective. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, if you're, you're talking about horrible abuses of power, you're talking about um, the, the atrocious things that one person does to another person. And uh, just when you think you've heard everything, mm -hmm. and there's simply nothing else that you could imagine that one person would intentionally do to another, somebody comes along with a story that just blows you away mm -hmm. all over again. So you're, you're dealing with very profound questions of human evil, human cruelty, human sadism, the abuse of, and the abuse of power and authority. Um, and the antidote to that is the solidarity of resistance. Nobody can do that alone. You, you say uh, at one point, uh, but we do know that the women who recover most successfully are those who discover some meaning in their experience that transcends the limits of personal tragedy. Most commonly, women find this meaning by joining with others in social action. And, 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 and this means concrete things. It means hearing other people's stories. It means uh, mentoring in, in the context of, of a tragedy, but also joining organizations that, that change the laws about what the ju uh, criminal justice system says is a violation of human rights. Right, it means going down and testifying um, before the legislature or uh, taking part in some kind of public education campaign or going to court or accompanying someone else to court uh, or demonstrating um, in, uh, in favor of uh, the assertion of victims' rights. Uh, rights. In, in looking at uh, uh, your career, you, uh, you combine political activism mm -hmm. with uh, 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 accomplishment in uh, a professional field. Mm -hmm. And some uh, concluded you know, in the 60s that that was not possible. That, that is to bring a sort of radical insight you know, to uh, expertise in given areas. Uh, I'm curious uh, as to what your advice would be to students who might, you know, read this interview and say, you know, gee, that's the kind of thing I would want to do with my life. H how do you prepare to, to be both an activist and a, a, a professional, you know, in a field like medicine and law? Oh, I think it was a lot easier in my generation. It just, it, it, we didn't have to find the movement, it just found us. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a 21-year-old daughter who's just graduated from college. She's trying to figure this out now. Mm -hmm. um, but the truth is that um, there's, you could start almost anywhere. Whatever, um, I mean, there are so many things in the world that need to be set right. You can start where, what, with whatever fires you up, whatever excites you, whatever fires your indignation, and put your energy there. And um, it's as good a place to start as any. I think that um, if, it, if it speaks to your heart, if it... Um, engages your imagination, if it makes you want to get out of bed in the morning and do something, that's probably the best place to start. I and mean, that, to me, is the insight of the, mo the political movements that I was part of, is, you know, organizations come and go. Mm -hmm. um, intellectual theories come and go. The, the power to change the way people think and what people do comes out of small groups of people who care enough about something to try something new. And that can be done anytime. And, and it's also about ideas, right? I mean, in, in embedding yourself in history in a way to, to sort of 
go with those new ideas and you formulate them yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it... There is an intellectual tradition of political activism, I think. It's, it's one of these things that um, isn't as strong in this country as in many others and um, often needs to be kind of reinvented and rediscovered in each generation. But yeah, it helps if you know that other people have thought these things before you have tried organizing before you. You don't have to invent everything from scratch. <laughs> But the, on the other hand, one's immediate historical cir circumstances are always new. Um, and I'd rather see people sort of take the plunge and try innovating and then have to study up because, oh my god, I better inform myself because mm -hmm. um, I need to arm myself with knowledge. Then try to deduce from the, the history of the past what should be done now. But for you, the study of uh, history and politics is absolutely fundamental to the study of psychiatry and psychology, or is, is that an overstatement? To me it is. It's uh, absolutely fundamental. Um, I just stop with that. You, you express a concern in, in your book uh, where you, you, you have a concern that new researchers will lack the passionate intellectual and social commitment of your generation. Uh, and you go on to say they will not see the essential interconnection between biological, psychological, social, and political dimensions of trauma. Oh, I think that's happening already. It's the price of respectability. <laughs> Unfortunately, the trauma field is now, it, you know, we're... Um, legitimate. We're legit. Mm -hmm. Yep. And people write dissertations and people apply for research money and, um, you know, drug companies get approval for their drugs for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, so it's ha I can see it happening already in the traumatic stress field. It's, you know... If you if you want to kind of keep it clean, it's nice to have some you know a nice clean auto accident victim study, <laughs> you know? um, and hopefully not for you know the not where there's any sort of uh, corporate liability in the accident, mm -hmm. uh, corporate negligence, but where it was truly an accident. Um, and then you can you don't have to get into any of this murky, messy social issue stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just do a nice psychobiological study, and you can randomly assign people to eight sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. or eight, eight sessions of a serotonin reup, or you know, eight weeks of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, or a combination of the two, mm -hmm. or a placebo, and see. Mm -hmm. what works best. They're, they're, that's a perfectly legit, legitimate mm -hmm. study. I'm not mm -hmm. against it. I just think that's not really where the in interesting questions lie. And, 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 and so finally, the, the interesting questions really lie in values, basically. Is that, is that the answer? Or? They lie in those areas that we don't understand yet that are m so murky and so confusing and so emotionally laden and so riddled with controversy that um, you know if you want to if, if you want to get your research funding you probably should stay away from there <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to really figure out how the mind works or how society works that's the place to go Dr. Herman uh, thank you very much for being here today sharing your story with us and your example actually for future uh, generations Thank you for having me. Thank you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.